Hello, and welcome to Differential Equations. This is Lecture 34, The Heat Equation. Last time, we talked about how Fourier sine and cosine series are particular cases of Fourier series. So we saw that if you started with a function on zero L and then you extended it to be periodic and odd, then you get the Fourier sine series as the Fourier series and periodic and even, and you get the Fourier cosine series as the Fourier series. This time, we're going to start looking at partial differential equations and how we can use the techniques we've built up to solve partial differential equations. Now that we've learned how to expand functions into infinite linear combinations, of sines and cosines, we're going to see how to use this to solve some simple partial differential equations. The first equation we will consider is called the heat equation. Okay, so let's consider heat transfer. This refers to the flow of energy through a body due to a difference in temperature. The actual energy transfer takes place by molecular collisions, but that doesn't really matter for us right now. What matters is that this transfer results in the temperature U depending on the space coordinates x, y, z, and on time t, right? So we say u is a function of x, y, z, and t. For simplicity, Suppose we have a pane of glass. And let's consider the heat flow only along 
one axis. So the picture to keep in mind is, let's say, here's the x-axis. And we have here's some pane of glass. Right, this thickness will denote delta x. Uh, this area, let's call it A. Then here we have some temperature U. And over here we would have U of x plus delta x. Right, or maybe better, let's consider that as u plus delta u. Right, so as we've just labeled, let's suppose the pane has thickness. Delta X and face area capital A. Let Delta U denote the temperature difference. Right. This will induce the heat flow. Let's let lowercase q denote the rate of the heat flow across this lab, right, this slab of glass that we're looking at. Experiments show that for a small delta x and delta u, q is proportional to capital A times capital times delta U divided by delta X. This says that we get more heat flow when the temperature difference and the area are larger And when delta x, the thickness of the pane, is smaller. Introducing a proportionality factor. Call it kappa. Known as thermal conductivity we obtain Fourier's law which says that Q is equal to minus kappa times delta u divided by delta x, or infinitesimally, 0.0001. 
q is equal to minus kappa times the derivative of u with respect to x. The minus sign accounts for the fact the heat flows from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. If we allow the heat to flow in any direction, so not just along the x-axis, then Fourier's law takes the form Q, the Q now promoted to a vector Q is equal to minus kappa times the gradient of U. The value of kappa depends on the physical composition of the material. With large values corresponding to good thermal conductors, such as metals. Okay, so next, let's bring in the first law of thermodynamics which says that energy cannot be created or destroyed only transformed. Thus, the rate of change of thermal energy with respect to time in some body is equal to the net flow of energy across the boundary. of that body. Right, of course, that's assuming no heat is generated within the body. Right, so we're assuming at the moment that there's no heat source, no heat sink, inside the body, we're just, we just have this temperature difference and we wanna see what happens to the heat. The rate of change of thermal energy 
is rho times c times the derivative of u with respect to t, where rho is the density of the material. And C is the specific heat the conservation of energy law is given by rho times C times the derivative of U with respect to T plus the divergence of Q equal to zero. This is in uh, three dimensions or in one dimension, rho times C times the derivative of U with respect to T equals minus the derivative of Q with respect to T, with respect to X. So if we put together the conservation law with Fourier's law, in the one-dimensional case, we get rho times c times the derivative of u with respect to t is equal to minus the derivative with respect to x of kappa times the derivative of u with respect to x. If we assume that rho, c, and kappa are constants, This simplifies to derivative of u with respect to t equals sigma derivative squared of u with respect to x. Here, sigma given by kappa divided by rho times c is called, sorry, I left out a minus sign there, is called the thermal diffusivity. Right? Diffusivity because you think of the heat diffusing. And in fact, this equation, the heat equation, also describes diffusion. Say you have uh, some liquid and you drop some dye and you see how it diffuses in your liquid, it, it also satisfies this equation, or rather this equation, it gives you a good model for how it, it spreads. If we take into account all three spatial dimensions, The equation is du by dt is equal to sigma times, and then you have the second derivative with respect to x plus the second derivative with respect to y plus the second derivative with respect to z. Right? This is what the heat equation looks like in three dimensions, and this is the heat equation one dimension. We'll stick to the one dimensional heat equation. This models, for example, 
the flow of heat in a thin cylindrical rod whose lateral surface is perfectly insulated. so that no heat flows through it. And it is reasonable. To consider u to be a function of only x and t. Okay, together with the equation, we need to know the initial temperature right, so this would be u at x comma zero. So we'll suppose that that's given to us some initial heat distribution, u naught of x, and the boundary conditions. The most common of which are the following. So first, these are known as the Dirichlet boundary conditions. So at an end, say at x equal to zero, then you specify what is the temperature at that end for all t. Right? So here we're specifying the uh, temperature So for example, you might stick the end of this uh, cylindrical rod into a furnace or into uh, an ice bath or something like that, where you're just saying what the temperature is at that end. It's known as the Dirichlet boundary conditions. This is named after uh, Peter Gustav Lejeune Dirichlet, uh, who's a German mathematician from, uh, who lived from 1805 to 1859. A fun story about his his name, his last name, as I just mentioned, is Lejeune Dirichlet. Uh, his father's father had moved to the German city of Duren from Richelet. This is a town in Belgium. And so he was known locally as the youth from Richelet, which in French is Lejeune Dirichlet. Lejeune Dirichlet. Uh, and so that stuck and became the family last name. Dirichlet made many important contributions to the study of Fourier series, uh, and he came up with the modern notion of function uh, as part of his study of Fourier series and what functions can be represented by a Fourier series. Uh, he, he got his name attached to these boundary conditions, not that he ever called them that, but um, studying something that's now known as the Dirichlet principle, which has to do with, with stationary solutions to the, the heat equation and um, uh, finding them using, uh, minimizing the value of some integral. Uh, to give some notion of, of the importance of Dirichlet or, or his prominence, when Gauss died in 1855, uh, Dirichlet was chosen to be his successor in Göttingen. <laughs>
Okay, second type of boundary condition, which we'll also be considering a lot, is Neumann. Uh, so this is when you specify the derivative of u with respect to x at an endpoint. So you can think about this as specifying the heat flux at this end. So for example, you can think of this as, as saying that an end is insulated so that there's no heat flux, right? That would correspond to the Neumann condition uh, with F equal to zero. Uh, this Neumann refers to Carl Gottfried Neumann, a German mathematician who lived from 1832 to 1859. He was most famous for his work on the Dirichlet principle that I mentioned a moment ago, and for some work he did on integral equations, um, specifically something known as the Neumann series, which lets you write down uh, the inverses of some integral operators as infinite series. The third type of boundary condition, which we won't study much in this class, but which does show up a lot, is known as the Roban boundary condition. So this is like a combination of the previous two. You specify some linear combination of the normal derivative and the value of u. at an endpoint. So this corresponds to a partially absorbing boundary. So you can think that the homogeneous Neumann condition, so if I put a zero here, that's a perfectly isolated boundary. There's no heat flow across that boundary. Whereas if I put a Roban condition, then it corresponds to partially absorbing. So part of the heat is absorbed at that boundary, but part of it can leak through. Uh, this is the sort of thing that you get if you want to impose, say, uh, Newton's law of cooling at one end. Um, right, so this, this is pronounced Roban, not Robin because the mathematician is named after was French, Gustave Robin, who was, a math who was alive from 1855 to 1897. He's best known for this boundary condition. So this is basically the, the only thing you find named after him, but it's a bit of a mystery how his name got attached to, to this boundary condition, because it doesn't seem to appear in his mathematical work. And it's just something that got yeah, named after him, but uh, it's not clear like who named that after him. But somehow or other, the name stuck. Uh, this shows up physically, uh, as I mentioned, in Newton's law of cooling. But also, if you have a, a boundary between metals and gases, say, then then this is the appropriate boundary condition to model that. Um, so typically, we impose. one of these boundary conditions at each end, right? So we think of this, this one dimensional metal rod as being on the X axis. And so you impose some condition at zero and some condition at L. You can pick whichever one of these you want at, at either end. Although typically, and in most of our examples, we'll just pick the same one and post at both ends. Uh, but another common condition I'll label it as number four is periodic. So here instead, you would say that the value of the temperature at zero is the same as the value at L and the value of the normal derivative Right, the derivative with respect to x is the same as both endpoints. 
So physically, you can think of this as being, uh, you actually had a, a ring that you were modeling and uh, you decided to take the ring and, and straighten it up to an interval then of course, because it really came from a ring, when, when you get to the end, you should be back where you started. So you have this periodic boundary condition. Okay, so let's, let's focus on the first one on the Dirichlet boundary conditions and let's work out how to solve the heat equation when you impose Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay, so the heat equation on the interval zero L with homogeneous there's the boundary conditions is right. So here homogeneous. So what I've written down here is the general Dirichlet boundary condition. So it's non-homogeneous if this function is not zero. The homogeneous case is when the function is zero, right? And similarly for Neumann and Robin and, and other boundary conditions. Okay, so here what we would have is first the equation. So the derivative of u with respect to t is equal to sigma times the second derivative of u with respect to x, right? So that's the heat equation. Then we would need to know at time zero, what is the initial heat distribution? And then at the left end point for all time, you have zero, and at the right end point for all time, you have zero. Right, so these are the homogeneous seriously boundary conditions. So here's how we're going to solve this. Our plan is to find the most general solution we can for the boundary value problem where I'm just going to ignore the initial heat distribution. So we'll find the most general solution we can for this problem. And then try to match the initial heat distribution. So this is a lot like how we've solved initial value problems where we used to just focus on the equation, find the general solution, and then plug in the initial conditions to find the constants in the general solution so that this it satisfies the initial value problem. So same thing here, except that we we're going to ignore the initial condition at time equal to zero and find the most general solution we can to this boundary value problem. To go about our first task, Notice that this equation satisfies the superposition principle. Right, which remember means says that 
linear combinations of solutions are also solutions. What that buys us is that we can look for simple solutions and then take linear combinations. Okay, so let's start by looking for separable solutions. So we write u of x t as capital X of x, capital T of t. Right? We're looking for u not equal to zero. If the solution is separable like that, then the heat equation becomes, okay, derivative of u with respect to t equals sigma second derivative of u with respect to x. So that's the same. On the left-hand side, I'm taking one derivative with respect to t. So if you start with this and take a derivative with respect to t, then nothing happens to the x and you get capital T prime of T. And then on the right-hand side, I have sigma times the second derivative with respect to X. So if I differentiate this right-hand side with respect to X, I get two derivatives of capital X and nothing happens to capital T. And now I can rewrite this as T prime of T divided by T of T. And let's put the sigma down there is equal to x double prime divided by capital X, right? And now we stare. This side is a function of t, and this side is a function of x. Okay, so another way of saying that is that this side only depends on t, it doesn't depend on x. And this side only depends on x, it doesn't depend on t. Okay, but if this side doesn't depend on t, then this side also does not depend on t because they're equal. So it has to just be a constant, right? And of course it's equal to this side, so that's also a constant, but you could also argue the same way. This side does not depend on x, so this side doesn't depend on x. So it's a constant. Now, just because we prefer to work with positive numbers over negative numbers, I'm gonna call this constant minus lambda Right? The minus sign is just going to make it so we work mostly with positive numbers. And so we can rewrite this equation and bring in the, the boundary conditions we have here as, well, t prime of t is just going to be minus lambda sigma capital T of t and capital X is gonna satisfy a boundary value problem. Capital X double prime of X is equal to minus lambda capital X of little x. And capital X of zero is going to be zero. Capital X at L is going to be zero. Okay. We recognize this boundary value problem that X satisfies is an eigenvalue problem. Right? Specifically, the one that leads to the Fourier sign series. So we already know what the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions are. We know that 
there will be a non-zero solution only when lambda, let's say only for lambda n equal to n pi over L squared and starts at one, two, three, and so on. And then the solution is a multiple of sine of n pi over L x. This means that capital T satisfies capital T prime is equal to minus sigma times n pi over L squared times capital T. And so capital T of T is a multiple of e to the minus sigma times n pi over l squared times t. Thus, the separated solution is u of x comma t equal to some constant, call it c sub n, times capital T, so e to the minus sigma n pi over L squared times T times sine of n pi over L x, right? That's the general solution to the equation that is separable, right? Here, cn is some arbitrary constant. Now that we've found all of the separable solutions of the heat equation when we ignore the initial boundary condition, or rather the initial heat distribution, We can add them together to see that u of x t given by the sum n goes from one to infinity of cn e to the minus sigma times n pi over l squared t sine of n pi over l x. We'll solve the equation. As long as it converges appropriately, which is not something we're going to worry about much in this class. Perfect. So ignoring the initial heat distribution, we ended up with this equation and we found a general solution to that. So our next plan is to find these constants and we're gonna find the constants by taking into account the initial heat distribution. So to choose the constants, we recall that we also wanted to impose 
u of x comma zero is equal to u zero of x, right? The initial heat distribution. Setting t equal to zero in the series solution. This becomes u zero of x is equal to the sum n goes from one to infinity of cn sine of n i over lx. Right, because all of these exponentials, if you put t equal to zero, you just get one. Okay, and we're in great shape because we recognize this as the Fourier sine series of u0. So we know exactly what these constants are. We should take the constants to be two over L times the integral from zero to L of u zero x times sine of n pi over L x, the x, right? Which you can review uh, in the lecture on Fourier sine series. Let's summarize this in a theorem. So let's phrase it like this. If u0 of x has Fourier sine series, u0 of x equals the sum n goes from one to infinity of a sub n sine of n pi over l x, Then the solution to the heat equation, the u dt equals sigma second derivative of u with respect to x, u at time zero is equal to u naught of x, and with homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions, The solution is u of x comma t equals, so I'm going to take the same series, right? The same ans, I'm just going to put in these exponentials, e to the minus sigma times n pi over l squared times t. And that solves the heat equation. Okay, let's do a quick example. Previously, we found that the Fourier sine series of x is uh, x is equal to two L over pi times the sum n goes from one to infinity of minus one to the n plus one divided by n times sine of n pi over L x. It follows that if you set up the heat equation and your initial heat distribution is the function x and you have homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions, then the solution is u of x comma t is equal to 2 L over pi 
sum n goes from 1 to infinity minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n e to the minus sigma n pi over l squared times t sine of n pi over l x. Right? And same thing with every Fourier sine series we've computed. We can plug it into this theorem, and it's immediately giving us the solution to the heat equation when you impose homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay, we'll stop there and pick it up next time.